This is Chris Roberts. He was the creative mind behind the wildly popular Wing Commander franchise that first took flight in 1990. I remember playing this game with my dad when I was a kid. Moving in. It was an amazing game for its time. The franchise was a huge success. They even got Mark Hamill to star in the game. I hope you're right, Admiral. I hope we are on the same side. Spoiler alert. They're not. Today, Chris Roberts is working on a new ambitious game called Star Citizen. He started accepting funding for the game after about a year of development, but that was back in 2012, more than 10 years ago. And after raising over $500 million and numerous failed attempts to adhere to a schedule, the developers have made a decision to not publicly discuss any official release timelines. Lately, I've become so frustrated with the gaming industry that I hired an Unreal Engine developer to help me create a fake game trailer. I wanted to test how easy it is to convince people that a project is real. I wanted to be in the trailer, so I had to shave my beard and wear a disguise to hide my identity. God, I can't wait till I get my beard back. And it worked. You all ate it up. And I'm going to explain why I did it, how I did it, and where we go from here. But before we jump into that, if you weren't aware, last month my PC was taken down by a hacker after my video brought attention to the cheating problem in Escape from Tarkov. Turns out, criminal organizations uh, get mad when their uh, servers are raided by the police. The hackers were able to identify who I was and target me, but I have since thought about my security on the internet, and if I had been using a VPN from Private Internet Access, the sponsor of today's video, I would have never been targeted in the first place. You all know how a VPN can allow you to access geo-blocked content, but something that most people don't realize is that when you connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot, all of your internet traffic is visible regardless of if you are in an incognito mode. I've always shied away from using a VPN because I don't want it to lower my ping when I am gaming. And it turns out that in many cases, your ISP is routing your connection through a congested or inefficient pathway to reach the gaming server. A VPN can potentially bypass that and connect you to a gaming service via a more direct and efficient path. In my testing, I had about a four to five millisecond faster ping on average when I was connecting to Colombian Tarkov servers using a Colombian VPN servers through private internet access. And it's not just about the ping. A VPN encrypts all internet communications coming from your device, making your personal data unreadable by third parties. Many of you have asked how you can support me, and I would appreciate it if you would head over to piavpn.com slash go to start using a VPN for 83% off. It wasn't cheap to hire a game developer to help me with this project, and sponsors like Private Internet Access allow me to make videos like this. For only $2.03 a month, you can protect yourself today. More information in the description box. When I was a kid, I bought physical copies of games or rented them at Blockbuster. Welcome to Blockbuster Video. Blockbuster Video. Rest in peace, Blockbuster. There wasn't going to be another update or version to look forward to until they release a follow-up title. And did they ever deliver? And whatever bugs existed on these little memory sticks became part of the game. And in some cases, the bugs lived on to become part of the franchise forever. Do you remember Warthog jumping in the original Halo? And here's where it gets interesting. The developers did not remove Warthog jumping in future releases of the game, and it still remains in Halo's Combat Evolved Anniversary Edition, still playable almost 20 years later. Recently, Nintendo revealed a new flying raft in a trailer for the upcoming game, Tears of the Kingdom, which is slated for release in a few weeks. The addition of this flying structure to the game has sparked speculation among fans, and some believe it was inspired by a popular Breath of the Wild flying guardian glitch. And there we go, we have takeoff. It's easier said than done to get this right. 90s kids will remember the missing number glitch Pokemon, which could be replicated under certain conditions. This glitch became quite popular, and some fans even created their own custom Pokemon card as a novelty item. IGN listed the bug as one of the top 10 best Easter eggs in gaming history. Catching it also ended up giving you an infinite number of whatever items you had in your six item slot. Very handy for rare items like Master Balls or Rare Candy. I can't really express to the younger audience how different it was encountering a glitch in older video games. It was like discovering a hidden gem. And today, you won't see anyone reference bugs in games as Easter eggs. It's just an expectation that you'll run into game errors. I threw up a quick poll in my Discord and the majority of players have never even filled out a bug report. And it's not because they aren't experienced 
experiencing bugs. I think it's because beta testing a game these days just means you accept the fact that the game is unfinished and broken. As time went by, the internet expedited the delivery of games to the consumer, to the point where almost all games today are downloaded over the internet. Developers now have the ability to release patches and updates on the fly, especially for multiplayer games. And today, it has become increasingly common for games to be released in beta status, unfinished. And unlike the past, bugs are introduced in new patches and content releases. The developer isn't testing anything at all in most cases. They have an unfinished product that needs more funding and attention. Attention so they can get more funding, more funding so they can push new content in a new patch so they can get more attention, more attention so they can get more funding and then more funding so they get more attention. It's, it's a circular loop. And part of the circular loop is to get attention and of course more funding. Oh my God, it just pulls you in, doesn't it? Part of getting more attention is releasing gameplay or cinematic trailers that do what is called vertical slicing. Game developers sometimes work on a small portion of a game to show off how gameplay will work before getting the green light to develop the rest of the game. The same concept as a pilot episode in television. Pilot episodes serve the same function as a vertical slice. However, they're often included in the official release of the series if it gets picked up. But this technique has been corrupted and gotten so out of control that some indie game devs put together a vertical slice of a game that is essentially theater. Nothing works. It's all movie magic. The world of the day before is teeming with hungry hordes of bloodthirsty infected. Unlike a TV series where what you see is what you get, you actually interact and play a video game. A vertical slice should be a working version of a game, but I'm watching someone else play. It would be very easy for them to hide problems with the game. And to get a better understanding of how easy it is to do this, I did it myself. This is Crimson. He's a game developer and streamer. Go check him out on Twitch. He's a really cool guy. And I sent him this storyboard. And this is how TVs, movies, and commercials are thought out. Directors and writers storyboard their ideas and then send it off to a producer to figure out how they're going to make everything happen. And the cinematographer, design team, and talent put together a plan and create a schedule, budget, etc. In this two-person studio, made up of Crimson and I, I made up a scene to show off an open-world loot extraction game I named Playglance. And here are some of the scenes from the trailer. Okay, we can uh, stop it right there. You can find a full video in a link in my description box, but it's not real at all. Look at what happens when we look around a bit too much. The city floats and nothing is interactable in this trailer. We had to hide any interaction with objects because that takes way too much time uh, to actually make things work in a game. The character didn't actually fuel up, uh, you just heard it happening, and the character didn't get out of a vehicle because animating that would be annoying. And to make the whole thing more believable, I introduced some of the developers working on the project. Creative director? That's my buddy Andy, uh, who doesn't even play video games. He's a musician and mixes music for a living. And the network programmer? That's David. He's an awesome dude, but he doesn't know anything about game development. And the lead developer? The inspiration for this project was when I watched a trailer for a similar type of game called The Day Before. The game rocketed to the number one spot on the Steam wishlist charts after they released what we now know was a fake game trailer. But unlike Playglands, The Day Before has not yet admitted to being fake, but it's been widely covered and the evidence is overwhelming at this point that this game will never be made in the way that it was represented in the trailers. And eventually we have arrived at a point where if an ambitious project is released, it's gonna be in beta format, incomplete, and the player base expects to test the game while the developers apply hotfixes and add content over time. For those of us who play New World, if you didn't hear about this game, it was created by this uh, small indie game studio uh, called Amazon. And for every new patch that fixed the problem, players experienced at least one new game-breaking bug to the point where sometimes they would have to roll the servers back due to the harm it created, which is absolutely terrible for an MMO. In order to combat the gold duplication via lagging exploit, the game now does not process transactions when one of the players involved is seen as lagging or being offline. This works fine to stop the exploit for now, but has wider reaching implications. It is important to note, these knee-jerk reaction hotfixes are being added directly to the live game, because at this point, New World does not have a public test realm or test server, so nothing is being tested before it goes live. I could easily make an entire 
entire video about just new world game breaking bugs, which Josh Strive Hayes did. You could easily crash other players' clients by simply typing in the text in your chat box. There was an almost infinite damage glitch with the hatchet for a good while, and during my entire time playing this game, the lag was so bad in wars, everyone would just be frozen on objectives for like 20 minutes. So here's the thing. Not all early access games are a complete mess. Take Minecraft, for example. It was first released as a free early access game back in 2009, but since then it has become one of the most successful games ever made. The difference between Minecraft and other early access games like Star Citizen lies in the development development process. You see, Minecraft initially accepted pre-orders in 2009, but as the creator of Minecraft, Notch himself, stated back in 2010, they didn't need much investment to complete the game. Yeah, uh, being able to be self-funded mm. is uh, the biggest like advantage. Um, a lot of people wanted to invest, but we didn't really need it, which mm. was it's great because now we just own ourselves. This funding allowed them to release the game in 2011, just a few years later. And as you know, the game's success continued to grow, eventually leading to Microsoft's acquisition of the company in 2014. Early access games can work, but why do they often fail? So let's take a moment to compare two wildly different space-themed projects. On one hand, we have SpaceX, an innovative rocket company that was able to design, build, and launch a Falcon 1 rocket into orbit in just six years, all with a budget of $100 million. And on the other hand, we have Star Citizen, a game about pretend rockets in space that has been in development for 13 years and has a budget that's more than five times that of SpaceX. And you might say that comparison is not fair. I know, revolutionizing the space rocket industry with only $100 million is much more difficult. And there isn't a game company out there that has an Elon Musk. However, Bethesda Game Studios has the Todd father. This is Todd Howard. He's the video game director and designer at Bethesda Game Studios. You've most likely played one of his games like Skyrim or Fallout. In a recent interview with Lex Freeman, Todd talks about his process creating Starfield, their upcoming open world space game. And unlike the unreleased Squadron 42, which is the single player component of Star Citizen, Starfield is coming this year. In the interview, Todd says he's been wanting to make Starfield for as long as he can remember, but he had to wait for the right time. The seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremie pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the gram meter. Because technology, am I right? The ability to time the launch of an ambitious space game was a skill that Chris Roberts did not have. Todd didn't just jump into making the game regardless of what was possible at the time. The first thing Todd and his team did was figure out how they could accomplish the most ambitious part of the entire project. Well, the first thing we did it was, how are we gonna render a planet, like pull it off for the player? Like, can we? Or do we have to sort of do it where you can't land on all of them, where you're landing in a very controlled, small, world space that we, you know, kind of craft and you would have a very limited set of those. Mm -hmm. They figured out how to procedurally generate and handle a thousand planets in their game. We started the game right after Fallout 4, so 2016. And the first thing we did, how can we have a system to generate these planets and make them look, well, I'll say reasonable, as opposed to, you know, fractally goop. We came up with a way, um, had prototyped of of building tiles, like large tiles of landscape, the way we would usually build them. We kind of generate them offline, hand do some things, and end up with these very realistic looking tiles of landscape, and then built a system that wraps those around a planet mm -hmm. and blends them all together. And we had pretty successful results with that. So we thought, yeah, we could we could do this. Before jumping feet first and designing star bases and selling virtual ships, they wanted to see if they could do the hardest part of the game development first and then work backwards from there. And even more importantly, Todd talks about why there are so many planets. What would you even do with all of them? There was a big design kind of problem to solve in terms of well, what's fun about landing on a planet where there's potentially nothing um, except resources. And so we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, let's just lean in on that can A, be a lonely experience, as long as we tell the player, here's what's there, here are the resources that are there, go find them. And I do think there's a certain beauty to landing on a strange planet, being somewhat the only person there, building an outpost, and we are modeling all of the systems because that's how we like to do things. So you can watch whatever that gas giant or moon, it will rotate and go and sunrise, sunset, and all of those things that you would expect. And it's, it's all really happening. Again, he's a master game designer and director. He's thinking of all these things far in advance. And I'm sure there are ideas and concepts that he wanted to attempt that they had to shelve. And while unfortunate, it's a good thing to find early in the process what can and can't be done. 
But there's one thing that Star Citizen is clearly doing better than Starfield. After doing a lot of research, I've come to the conclusion that Star Citizen's crowdfunding is a masterclass in how to raise money for a project. I just wish I could say the same thing for their game development. They've pulled out every trick in the book, allowing backers to spend as little as $45 and as much as a hundred grand? And I started with the war pack. So that's an old pack. I don't think it's available anymore. It's, it was $5,100 at the time. I found an interview with a player who spent $100,000. People who throw this sort of money around are called whales. And this whale started off with a war pack for a mere $5,100 back in 2017. I, I remember being in hangers and being like, this is not what I thought it was. And then looking into the refund policy and there's no refund policy. And then I was running a tech company at the time and I was like, well, I got to go do work. So I'll and this well accepts the fact that giving money to a game company is akin to gambling in Vegas. The way I look at it, 100,000 is not a significant amount of money if you consider Vegas. So I'm not a big gambler. I don't like gambling, but I have other members of my family. Uh, who do enjoy that kind of stuff and have gone to Vegas and spent, you know, $25,000 on one hand of blackjack or so. And for me, it's video games and spaceships. Star Citizen even lets you purchase the individual ships, which can cost as much as $3,600. I must admit that these ships are really neat. And much to my surprise, the Javelin sold out in five minutes, but they haven't kept people from spending money on it. For example, you could get the Javelin with this Legatus pack for $27,000. They even have a concierge service to handle these sort of transactions. I always tell myself I'm never going to spend another dollar and uh, all I have to do is release another spaceship and I'll spend more. I, I, I'm just too addicted to the idea of the game. This ship that we are looking at right now is called the Javelin and a limited number of people bought these back in 2014 and 2015. If you had purchased them in the past, you'd be the proud owner of one of these bad boys. Just look at this thing. It's got an infirmary and a place to launch smaller ships that your friends could bring along for the ride, but the ship isn't in the game yet. And even if it magically was in the game, staffing one of these ships would almost fill up the entire server's capacity. Two javelins fully staffed is more than the 120 player limit that a server can handle in one area. Star Citizen is an MMO in theory, but in practice, nobody in the game can actually experience large scale space battles. And while Star Citizen backers will criticize the scope of Todd Howard's game, Starfield is an actual game with a release date that you'll be able to play, you know, in reality. Take a look at this timeline of events that have taken place while Star Citizen has been in development. While Star Citizen was in pre-production, Instagram launched, Windows 8 was released about the same time as their Kickstarter, and Unreal Engine 4 and 5 both became part of Game Developer's Toolbox, all while Star Citizen disabled their hangar module due to a bug. All this happened while From Software released six games, including Dark Souls 1 through 3. Oh yeah, and uh, Elden Ring. And while a Star Citizen Whale is still waiting for his javelin to be delivered that costs as much as a used Altima, he'll likely FOMO into the latest and greatest ship after each update. It's basically a part of Star Citizen's business model at this point. It's an addiction. I, I, I'm just too addicted. And they even have a multi-level market scheme called their Creator Referral Program, which puts the community at work to sell more copies of the game. Star Citizen is on track to raise over $1 billion by 2025 if they keep pace with their current financial statements, which showed nearly $700 million in overall funding to date. And while this Star Citizen orca in this interview is quite content with his support for the game... What, what's kept me around, honestly, is the fact that it's in development. The bug hunting is fun to me. Not everyone would agree. There's a vibrant community of people who created a Star Citizen refund subreddit, encouraging players to try to get their money back and mostly just like bashing the game. Star Citizen did receive enough pressure to change some of their policies to prevent refunds from going through. One major difference between crowdfunding a game versus finding investors is that backers often encourage what's called feature creep. Backers don't get a financial return when a game is finished. In fact, the game is finished too early, they get less features per dollar. It's not like backers are having to pay a monthly subscription fee or pay for the operating costs like a true investor would. There's almost no reason individual backers would push back against new features being added to the game, but they should. And this is where you get into this absurd situation where AI is frozen and broken everywhere in the game, but the developers are proud to announce bedsheet deformation physics, you know, for immersion. Most backers are not whales, and they have a, a, a relatively small amount of money invested. They don't have anything on the line other than their expectations that will surely be crushed. Backers don't approach the situation like a real investor, because the money they threw in is gone regardless of what happens. For a thought experiment, imagine what would happen if Chris Roberts had to go on Shark Tank initially to secure funding. Who is going to be the lucky shark to invest in my game, Star Citizen? 
Did you work on a game before Star Citizen? Oh yes, I created the game Freelancer. Catch! What happened with that project? I ran out of money after four years and was bailed out by Microsoft and later left the project <laughs> before it was completed. I have to call out the white elephant for me in the room. This looks just like Freelancer. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's okay there, buddy. We'll just scam some gamers. And while Chris can make false promises and avoid answering questions his backers ask him if he doesn't want to, when you are speaking to a real investor, the FTC will throw you in jail for fraud if you lie. And if they were to press him on why Freelancer was so expensive and delayed, he would likely respond the same way he always does. Nobody has ever tried to create a game with this magnitude and scope. And the investor's next question would be, is there perhaps a reason for that? But why is Cosmic Chris so addicted to adding features to the game? Because a pre-release game must keep everyone engaged and entertained while the game is being developed. If they add no new features until release, by the time the game comes out, it'll be old and boring. Mr. Roberts admits himself that this would be a problem back in 2012, when he said it would be ideal to only take three years to complete. Any more and things would begin to get stale. Oh man, that quote aged like milk left out in the sun. Adding features to encourage backers to keep playing and investing works to some extent, but it can become the nail in the coffin if the game already is behind schedule. Each new feature seemingly a small addition, but can cause major bugs, delays, and they start to stack up and cause all sorts of complexity and problems that can bring a game to its knees. But Colonel Cosmos has decided to do the opposite. Recently, he has admitted numerous times that the game will probably never actually have a release date and Star Citizen will continue to be worked on for the foreseeable future. And it's not like they have a somewhat advanced, stable game that they're holding the release back because they want to add new and amazing features. Star Citizen's AI and server stability is completely laughable right now. The feature creep has halted progress on the game so much so that it's sort of a meme to try to do anything in the game before your ship blows up or you get disconnected or have some other game break and bug that destroys your experience. When feature creep combines with the sunk cost fallacy, the belief that we should continue investing in something simply because we've already invested so much. Disaster often follows. It's like being on a spaceship that's taking on too much weight, but instead of dumping unnecessary cargo, the crew decides to keep it all because, you know, they've already spent so much fuel getting it on board. The result is a slow moving vessel that's more likely to crash and burn than to reach its destination. By the time Star Citizen releases, the technology that was once innovative will be ancient. AI will probably create more efficient development processes and competition could swoop in and create a better version before the project is even complete, making Star Citizen a true waste of resources. And that's happening right now with games like Starfield. If you're an average consumer new to this space and you're looking for a futuristic space game to play, my bet is that you'll choose Starfield over Star Citizen this year. And while Star Citizen may continue to attract attention with its lofty promises and massive crowdfunding campaign, the inevitable delays and feature creep are likely to alienate more and more fans over time. Starfield will continue to offer DLCs and modding and opportunities to keep players engaged for years to come. And slowly, over time, Star Citizen could be cut off from their massive crowdfunding campaign. I'm not some vengeful gamer god sitting atop an ivory tower of investment wisdom trying to destroy Star Citizen. In fact, I throw my money at all kinds of pre-release projects. I'm like a moth to a flame, but instead of a flame, it's a promise of a game that'll blow my socks off. And sometimes it does, but mostly I'm left barefoot and disappointed. And that's the magic of crowdfunding. When the suits in the boardroom don't see the value in your vision, crowdfunding can bring together a community of passionate supporters who share your dream. Sure. The game you're backing might not end up being finished or it might not turn a profit if it even does release. But that's the beauty of crowdfunding model. It's a chance to take a risk, to explore uncharted territories and to boldly try what others have deemed impossible. But I have a few lessons I've learned that I'd like to share after playing early access games for the last like 20 years. Before you give money to a game, assess if you can get your value back with what is currently playable. This is the reason I've played Tarkov for so long and have yet to pull the trigger on Star Citizen. Despite the problems with Tarkov, I've played for thousands of hours and I've enjoyed it. Star Citizen is a tougher sell. Every time I ask people if the game is ready to be played, they all warn me it's still not really in a great place. I was going to pop my head in and see what's going on recently and players haven't been able to reliably log in and play for over a month at this point after the 3.18 patch. But I'm open to having my mind change and let's be real. Starfield won't replace Star Citizen. They are trying to do different things, and there's enough space for both of them. Get it? Space. And besides, AI and technological advances might make long and expensive game development irrelevant over time. And I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket. I've made that mistake before. I won't be a cheerleader or a fanboy for any specific game developer ever again. Every time I get heavily involved in an early access game, I almost feel like I'm part of the production and the future of the game. You know the downsides of getting involved with an early access game. Even after doing all of the research for this video, I can't hardly resist checking out Star Citizen and wanting to write a blank check to Daddy Roberts. 
So what does this mean for me? And what about the future of gaming? It's truly incredible to be close to the action as a developer creates the most sophisticated and intricate video game ever made. Tarkov and Star Citizen are not just expensive games that take forever to develop. They are truly unique and special. Maybe one day AI will swoop in and help speed up game development. But until that day, I'm going to continue to check in on these projects. Hey there, buds. Uh, have an interesting story or a lead that I should investigate? Join the Discord and send me a tip. I'm open to more than just gaming-related content. And have you heard about this new Star Citizen game that that's coming out? Check out my referral link to get a free in-game credit so I can add another ship to my hangar. You think I'm going to spend real money on these ships after this video? I'm not kidding. I'm not going anywhere until you click that link in the description box.